We are on Facebook and Twitter with our post show, continue our discussion on vaccine equity. Dr. Anderson, we got most of your thought out on the broadcast, but if you want to add more, please continue. Yeah, I was just going to go a step further and just, just stress the importance of us considering mobile as a strategy, not just for what we're facing today in terms of making sure we get the, the vaccine to people's front door, but I think we need to get back to thinking about this as an important public health strategy. Mm. Um, there are many organizations across the country that have appropriately leveraged mobile clinics to actually improve rates of prostate cancer screening, colon cancer screening, educational engagement. These are things that are critical components of what are basic pieces of good public health. And uh, Senator Sonia Chang, Sonia Chang Diaz, where are we with that mobile piece? Because I had heard that Yankee bus had retrofitted one of their buses and is prepared to do others uh, to do just that, to be mobile units uh, offering the vaccine. What would stop that being, um, you know, um, underscored and and put ag- actually out front? Uh, what, what 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 would it take? Do, you, do we have to pass that bill to make that I'm happen? I'm so glad you asked that, <laughs> Kelly. It's one of the pieces of the bill that really hasn't uh, been acted on at all. You know, we've made progress on some of the pieces. Let's mention, you know, since we filed it, we've seen action on um, some of the, you know, dollar investments in the grassroots and mass media um, information campaigns. Um, you know, I'd like to see more dollars there, um, but the governor just announced the $4.7 million investment. So, you know, it's a start. Um, We've uh, seen more attention on, you know, talk, starting to talk about the metrics. We haven't gotten to the right, you know, benchmarks, but on the mobile, we really have not seen progress. Um, and this is a place where, you know, you mentioned about um, low income white residents of the state. This is a place where there's so much common cause um, to be had with rural communities. Uh, you know, and Liz mentioned the two other uh, co filers of our Vaccine Equity Act, uh, one of whom is uh, Representative Dom, and then one of our heavy the advisors on the bill uh, was Senator uh, Comerford, both of whom represent the sort of Amherst, uh, Happy Valley area of the state, lots of farm country. Uh, and they have the problem of folks who are really isolated, you know, very little mass transit, if any, um, and folks who don't have access to a car are really isolated from being able to get to these, uh, these mass sites or even regional sites. Um, and so a mobile program really has the benefit of being so versatile because you could have in urban c- scenarios you know, maybe a big van or a few big, you know, a fleet of a few big vans that can go and sort of park in a parking lot, you know, in this neighborhood for a week and that neighborhood for a week and that neighborhood for a week. Um, but in, in a farm country environment, you might want to have, you know, a much lighter, more agile fleet of, of cars, right, where you have maybe a lead car that's going out to a farm um, and getting farm workers, right, 15 at a time, let's say, um, and getting their paperwork done with them. And then the next car comes and the first car goes on to the next site um, and the next second car is giving the shots, right? And then the third car comes and they're waiting with the, with the uh, farm workers for that 15 minute observation period while the other cars have gone on to the next farm and the next farm. Um, but the mobile program, hugely important piece. I can't tell you how many healthcare professionals have said this as a primary recommendation. Um, and look, if we cannot get um, vaccines to people, because and I, I think we can, right? Because healthcare professionals have told me so. Um, but if there are logistical limitations with the freezers and this, you know, if we can't get the vaccines to people, let's get the people to the vaccines. And another piece that I would tack onto this is I don't know why we have not um, tapped into the resource of the National Guard for helping um, both with a mobile program and transportation support services, but also those, you know, those live human being outreach phone calls. I'd rather not have National Guard knocking on people's doors, yeah. but I don't know why we can't have them phone banking right. um, or driving, you know, driving vehicles to get people to vaccination sites. And that's 100 percent reimbursable by the federal government. So here's a question. You, uh, 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 Representative Liz Miranda said some pieces, or maybe both of you said, have been acted upon, but the majority of your bill have, has not been acted upon. Is there the political will to see this bill get passed and enacted? So let's start there. What, what are you two, what's the feeling? 
So one thing that's been really great, the senator and myself are all members. I was newly appointed about two weeks ago, and I hit the ground running. And I just want to thank uh, Dr. Tia and everyone that joined us in the Health Equity Task Force. We heard from hundreds and hundreds of people through written and spoken testimony. Um, some were practitioners and providers, and other were just regular citizens of the Commonwealth that said to us, we know what to do, and we want you to do it now. I think there is political will, but we need continued pressure. This is where we need everyone from Pittsfield to P-Town uh, to Roxbury to the little corners of uh, the little town of Peru and Western Mass to say, uh, we got to do this right. This is the Commonwealth this of Massachusetts. We are the, uh, the home of bio and life sciences, entrepreneurship and the creative economy, the best institutions that are of medicine and education in the world. If there is one state in the union that I thought would have got this right, it is us. And I think that what we are, are faced with is that we began the process not centering the people that we already knew were getting sick and dying. And I, I would say about the mobile, you know, thank you for reminding us about the family van. I think about our undocumented brothers and sisters and in the Commonwealth, I don't know what the numbers are, but I remember uh, I'm the filer of the Safe Communities Act. We have a great bill on uh, driver's licenses. There are a lot of people that are still fearful of engaging with systems, systems who have not protected them uh, before, long before COVID. And we cannot go back to normal. Here's an opportunity when Dr. Tia talks about this is the opportunity that we now change course, not just in COVID-19 recovery and response, but in the ways in which we take care of our communities, whether they're rural, whether they're urban, whether they're uh, central Massachusetts or the Cape and Islands, we have an opportunity here to pressure and push the governor. I need everyone uh, to be able to call their representative and senator, say we need to pass all elements of this bill now, give more money, uh, support all the tenants of this, uh, this bill because it works. That's the whole point. Um, we want to be able, the governor just gave new guidance, and I'll end here, that we're going to 50%. Yeah. Uh, we might be opening uh, some of our larger facilities, yet a large population of our residents in the Commonwealth have yet to not only get tested, but to get vaccinated. I think that's a misstep. And so if in order for us to be safe while we're opening and growing, we need to vaccinate more people. And so this is the issue of our time. This is the urgent issue um, that we need to be fierce about. So two Go ahead. Um, can I just jump in and add something you mm. mentioned about political pressure and, and mustering the political will, right? I think we're in the, the momentum is growing, but we're not all the way there yet. So two things that I would mention that folks can do to help us build that political pressure. It, one is the Vaccine Equity Now Coalition has put up a petition site um, that is a petition directed to the governor, right, to get him to just use his executive powers. He could just say yes to all of these things today with the stroke of a oh, pen. Okay. Um, so would encourage folks to go visit that petition site. Um, and then also let's do a little belts and suspenders, right? So if the governor is not going to act on these things, then the legislature needs to be poised to act. Um, so we've also invited folks to become citizen co-sponsors of the Vaccine Equity Act. Oh. Um, and you can actually add your name uh, right to the bill. It will appear on the bill itself. Um, if folks are willing to share their name and their address, you also can be a, sp a sponsor along with me and Rep, Rep Miranda with the bill. So those are two action steps that people can do to help us build that momentum. Um, Dr. Anderson, you were about to say something? No, I was going to say, I really, first of all, really appreciate the, the work that both the Senator and the Representative and, and uh, Atia are doing regarding this. Here's the other piece I would offer that becomes really important. Um, let's step away for a minute and just say, let's just focus on the scientific argument, right? Viruses want to do one thing. They want to get in cells within a host and they want to replicate. The more they replicate, and we know which communities they're replicating more because we can see the infection rates, et cetera. The more they replicate, every now and then something changes. A little mutation happens. Part of natural selection is if that mutation allows that particular variant to be better at infecting a host, it's going to be selected, right? If that particular variant is going to be able to avoid these wonderful antibodies that we're generating with these vaccines, that variant is going to be selected and is going to end up being dominant. There's a scientific argument here to be made that we need to get straight away 
at vaccinating in these communities, in our communities that are most heavily hit, suffering the highest burden of this virus to protect everybody. And I think that's an important message that we need to make sure that we're communicating as well. So I want to I want to say it a different way and have you add to it, which is everybody in the whole state can be vaccinated except for the communities we're talking about. And you do not have herd immunity. Guess what? You're not safe just because you got the vaccine because the rest of us don't have it. Well, worse than not having herd immunity. You can have you can have a new variant that all of a sudden the immunity that you thought you had no longer is protected. But my point is, you, you can select out people that you don't, th- you know, while you're rushing past to get yours. It doesn't matter in the end if I don't get mine. Absolutely. That doesn't that seem to be very important. That doesn't seem to be re- registering with folks. So yeah. I, well, as, <laughs> as we see these variants coming up, as we see these variants coming up, it needs to start registering. With right. Folks. So now I have another question I want to put on the table because this is somewhat concerning. It's a little bit people are trying to figure out how to address it. So it's likely that uh, today or this week, the J&J vaccine will get approved for an emergency use. And the number that keeps being attached to the J&J vaccine is that it's quite effective, but it's at 60 percent versus Pfizer, 90 percent. OK, um, it's supposed to be stronger against the va- variants that you discussed, Dr. Anderson. But some are suggesting, well, what happens if they send now that that's more supply of the J&J to communities of color and uh, communities of color are like, oh, yeah, right. OK, so when y'all decided to send some vaccines, you send us the one that's 60 percent. So let's talk about, you know, because that could get to be very confusing and upsetting and create even more hesitancy if these if the if the vaccine is not to your point, Dr. Anderson, the story of it not made clear that take whatever you can get, because everybody's going to probably have to have a booster anyway. You know, we're, it's all evolving. But I'd like you That's to respond really, to that. Really interesting. My uh, mm-hmm. mom, who just turned 82 yesterday, her big thing at the beginning of all this is that I want to make sure that I get the vaccine that everybody else is getting. I don't want to get the black vaccine. Right. <laughs> that was her thing. Right. And so when she heard this, that was to her that uh, announcement that here was the black vaccine. Mm. But here's the point. When, we, when these studies are designed and they talk about effectiveness, the criteria that they're looking at is not necessarily, um, let's, let's, here's, here's a better way to explain it. All of these vaccines, right? all these vaccines that have been tested, it's very clear that they prevent death and severe hospitalization and hospitalization, right? When you start looking at effectiveness, it's about are you going to have moderate, mild symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. So the reality is just looking at this percent effectiveness isn't really the right way to think about it. The better way to think about it is that any of these vaccines are going to give me an immunologic response that's going to prevent me from dying, right? That's the key. And it's not tied to that 65% preventing me from dying or not, because that's not what this study measured. Okay, very good. Um, Atia, what could we be doing right now um, other than what uh, Senator Chang Diaz has suggested, which is, you know, sign the position, sign the petition. I didn't know until this moment that the governor could just sign off, make an executive order and all these things can be in place. Um, what's he saying? He seems to be I, I heard him in the in the hearing yesterday saying he recognized there had been some errors, but I don't know that he spoke directly to errors around issues of equity. So uh, the so the first piece is um, yes to everything that was said in um, one quote um, I'll share with folks that has been really helpful for me to ground myself in is power without accountability is a recipe for disaster. And so making sure that we're leveraging all of the different power that we have to hold those with traditional power accountable is essential. Otherwise, we end up where we are right now, where people don't feel like they need to listen. They can just do what they want to do. So I just say that explicitly. And I think the other piece is figuring out um, how we can advocate uh, or how we can partner with our local public health departments. Um, Part of the challenge of mobile vaccinations um, to a point that was mentioned earlier um, is that 
the, the local public health departments have been deprioritized. So they are having trouble getting access to the vaccine in order to be able to do these more specialized types of initiatives like mobile vaccinations. And so without our public health departments being able to get access, then we end up in the same situation. And so I wanna make sure that, um, that we're lifting that up as an issue that is a problematic um, and was already problematic before this. Um, the other um, thing just wanna mention um, is being able to um, volunteer uh, when those opportunities do become available to support the efforts to help black and Latinx and other people of color and marginalized groups to get access to the vaccine. Um, and to talk to the people that you love in your circle to support them in having good quality information to make good quality decisions. Um, right now there's a black hole of quality information that's being filled with um, conspiracy theories and a lot of misinformation. And so the more that we can learn ourselves so that we can then share that with our loved ones um, so that we can help get people vaccinated. And it's not about finger wagging and telling people what they need to be doing. Um, and if we're talking about equity, we're talking about helping people to get there for themselves. We can't save people, people have to save themselves. And that's part, that's the part of our interdependence and interconnectivity, um, which is where our land and why it's so important for us to be able to um, have the kind of, um, of support of different communities getting access to the vaccine because we live in an interdependent, mm. interconnected society, period, end of story. Well, that's a great place to end. I thank you all for your insight and information and thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you.